Well, this is week two in our five-week series we're calling If You Only Knew. And throughout this series, we will be talking about some of life's great moments of transition, transitions like the one Amy talked about last week, the time when adult children begin caring for their elderly parents. And I hope you heard Amy's sermon. Uh, It was a wonderful message, and it came right out of Amy and her siblings experience now as they're caring for their older parents. Amy was the right person to deliver that message, uh, and she did it with such grace and respect. Can I just say, if you haven't heard it, I think it's a must listen. It's a must listen. This week, we're looking at another major moment of uh, transition in life. It's when you become a parent to adult children, and I guess I was the obvious choice for bringing this message because I've been, or rather I should say Jennifer, my wife and I have been parenting adults now for as long or maybe a little longer than we parented infants, young children, and adolescents. We have three children, adult children, Jacob who's 45. Uh, Emily is 42, and Elizabeth is 39. They are adults. They all have children, eight between them. And believe me, they are living adult lives. So I guess I should be qualified to speak to the subject. Though it's a subject that I have to say, and I'll have to, I sometimes wonder how to actually say it, this subject can be all over the map. Uh, Things are always in flux when you're parenting adult children. Parenting adult children is, I would say, it's dynamic. It can be wonderful, difficult, confusing, frustrating, maddening, and heavenly, all in the space of one Christmas family get-together. And that Christmas get-together can be very different experiences for the older adult parents and the younger adults. What may seem absolutely appropriate to an older adult can strike a younger adult as terribly insensitive and inappropriate. And may I say vice versa. It works both ways. I know this to be true from my own life both ways because I am an older parent who is being a parent to adults and I've also gone through the experience of having an older parent who is trying to parent me as an adult. Now I do want to say I'm not certified as an expert on all this stuff. They didn't have a course for this in seminary, okay? But I do have decades of experience parenting adult children, and there are a couple of things, a couple of things that I am sure of. And the first thing is this, that in our culture, in our culture, we raise our children to be independent Jennifer and I did. We raised them to be independent. But when our children flex their independence muscles, they don't always follow in their parents' footsteps. I have absolutely no problem with any of my children's career decisions or their financial decisions or their child-raising decisions or their food choice decisions. But when you raise them to take care of themselves, they take care of themselves. And often they do so in ways that I don't even recognize. Oh, and another thing that I am very sure of is this. When you have more than one adult child, you can bet that all of your children will make very different decisions about career and finances and child rearing and food. Again, I want to reiterate that I have nothing to be upset about when it comes to my kids. Nothing. But this COVID thing, 
Let us put a microscope on the business of adult children from the same family making very different decisions about what is appropriate and acceptable. I'm just saying, trying to remember three different COVID protocols, I'm just saying, okay? One thing that I have done, though, is that I've spent a lot of time looking at what the Bible has to say on this subject, and while I said I don't consider myself to be any kind of Bible guru concerning the things related to parenting adult children, I do think that I've got a handle on some things that will help us, help all of us, no matter where we find ourselves in this delicate dance of being a parent to adult children. So what I want to do is I want to pray, and then I want to get after it, okay? So let me pray for us. Father, please make what I say today something that you are pleased with. I pray that you will help us to be the best of people that we can be in the world and that we will see from your word what you desire for all of us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into this, um, I do want to say... Hello to everybody that's online. I want to say hello to everybody at Fishers and everybody at North Indy. Glad to be with you today. And so let's find out what the Bible has to say on this subject. And to be very honest, completely honest with you, it doesn't say very much. It doesn't say very much. I do believe that there are two verses in the New Testament that are relevant to today's subject, but truthfully, there aren't any teachings or commands or parables or anything really that say this is always important when you are the parent of adult adult children or that says this is how an adult child should respond to their older parent. But both of the two relevant verses that I'd like to look at. They were both written by the Apostle Paul, who was one of the leaders in the early church, and he wrote a number of the books that we find in the New Testament. And the relevant verses are these. The first one is Ephesians 6, 4, and we're going to focus mostly on this, so if you have a Bible and you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, that's where we'll be spending most of our time. But that verse says this, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the, with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. And then the other verse that's important is uh, Colossians 3.21, and I would say that it is a twin verse written by the same man, and it says this, this, essentially the same thing. It says, fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Now, my bet is that your first reaction to hearing these verses is something like, wait a minute. These verses aren't talking about parenting adult children. These verses are about parenting younger children. And I get that. I get that. But let me tell you something about the Greek in these two verses. There is a word for younger children in Greek. And that word is pedion. But the word that Paul uses when he says children in both verses here is not pedion. He uses the word tekna. And tekna is a word like our word children. Uh, Let me explain. Listen to this sentence. I have three children. And between my three children, they have eight children. Now, you know exactly what I mean when I say that. Because the context lets you know that when, whether I'm talking about, I mean, you, you didn't think immediately when I said I have three children that I have three little children. And then especially when I said, and they have eight children between them, then you knew that I was talking about what? Older adults were my children. This just makes perfect sense. That's the kind of word that techna is that Paul uses here in this verse. Plus, here in Ephesians and In Colossians, these are children who can be angered and aggravated and discouraged, and these are very what? Adult emotions. And we'll talk about those words in a minute, but the context tells us that Paul is just as likely to be talking about older children or even adult children 
as young children when he's saying this. So I want you to step back a minute and let's put this verse into that Ephesians context. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, this this verse is found in a much longer section of this letter that Paul sent to the Christians in the town of Ephesus. And he was giving them instructions on all sorts of family relationships. He, has, he talks about husbands and wives. He talks about children and parents. Then he comes to this part where he talks about fathers and children and such. And I have to say that what Paul says in this passage is some of the most radical, countercultural, table-turning stuff in all of first century Greek and Roman literature. Now that may sound like I'm going way over the top there, but you know what, I believe it, it is. I believe that it is all of that. When Paul talks about husbands and wives, he tells them that they should submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But he says this in a world where wives were the property of their husbands. In fact, Women who were wives were not legally people. They were simply their husband's possession. Paul wrote this at a time when when husbands were under absolutely no obligation whatsoever to pay any attention to their wives, let alone show them any love or respect. Paul told husbands and wives to submit to one another in a world where a man could divorce his wife simply for the, re- for the fact that she had served him a breakfast that he did not find to his liking. He says this in that world. Paul says husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. Nobody would have ever thought of that one before. And Paul also talked about children obeying their parents, but he said the reason for them to be honoring and obedient towards their parents is because we belong to the Lord. Now, he could have said, he could have said, children, you better obey your parents because they have absolute power over every aspect of your life. Because parents did have absolute power over every aspect of their children's, their young children's lives. Or he could have said, you better obey your parents because it's a capital crime to disobey your parents. He could have said that because it was a capital crime to disobey their parents. But no, he said, honoring your parents is the right thing to do if you belong to Jesus. And then Paul said what we've read earlier, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them, rather bring them up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. There is a reason, a reason that Paul says fathers here. There is a Greek word for parents, but he he doesn't use it. He uses the word for fathers. Fathers in the first century Roman and Greek world had what was called, and it's called patria, Potestus, patria potestus, and patria potestus is the father's power, and it was, this power was absolute. Even if the child was an adult, fathers could sell their children as slaves if they wanted to. They could force them to work at any kind of work. They could put them in chains if they so desired. They could even choose to take the law into their own hands and put their own children to death because that's what they wanted to do. And get this, Roman sons never came of age, never. As long as their father was living, his sons were obligated to obey him in everything without question by law. Now, truth is, fathers rarely went so far to put their own children to death. They didn't. But the threat of patria 
potestas was always lurking in the background in relationships between fathers and their children. And also, I don't know if you know about this, but it was just a given that every person's life was considered to be a gift from their father because the way their culture worked was when a newborn baby was born, they would bring the baby to the father and set it on the ground in front of the father's feet. And if the father stooped down and picked the baby up, that meant that he wanted it kept. But if he saw the baby, and usually if it had a deformity or was a girl, he could turn around and walk away, and the people in the family, including the mother, were obligated to either set the baby out to let it die in the elements, take it to the city form to be picked up by whomever wanted it to do with it whatever they wanted or to drown it. Law. And it's into this world, this world, that Paul says, fathers do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. And one aside before I go on, We know that fathers don't have this kind of control over their children's lives now. We don't live in that world. We also know that children in our world are raised by all sorts of arrangements of people. I think that everything that we're about to see that Paul says to fathers here, we could also say to mothers and grandparents and anybody else who is in the position of raising children. It works for everybody. It's okay in our culture. Anything that's good enough for dad will be good enough for mom. I'll just say it like that. And what Paul says is he says, don't, and the word he uses is paragizo. Paragizo. And it means don't irritate your children. Don't irritate them. It means, it's a word like, don't embitter them. Don't do things that push them into anger. Just don't do that. The verse in Colossians 3 also adds that fathers shouldn't, the word is athumeo, and it means don't dismay them or dishearten them. Actually, the word is generally used to talk about when somebody drains the spirit out of somebody. Does that make sense? When you just get on them to the point where they just don't have any life left in them. And Paul says, don't do that. Don't do that. Clearly, Paul was being very direct. These statements are both in Ephesians and Colossians, they're imperatives, they're commands. Father, I am, and I'm going to add mother here, it says, don't do anything that provokes your children or angers them or embitters them or breaks their spirit. And I don't think Paul would have brought this up if he hadn't seen it happening in places where he had been. But he wasn't finished. The NLT says this, rather bring them up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, Paul uses a word here, The word that says bring them up, and the Greek word is, it's ektrytho, and it means, and this is really sweet, it means to nurture something you cherish. That sure is different sounding than raise them up. It's nurture something that you cherish. And that word for discipline We have a thought in our mind that what is it when a father disciplines his children? We we think about what? Punishing them or spanking them or something, and yet that word, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with training somebody, leading them in the right way. Our word discipline has such negative connotations, and I have to say Paul's not being negative here at all. So if I were going to translate this verse, what we would have so far is this. It would go, fathers and mothers, don't do anything that provokes your children, angers them, embitters them, or breaks their spirits. But nurture your cherished children in the training and instruction. And then we get to the really important part in the NLT. It says, that comes from the Lord. And that little phrase is really important. And here's why it's important. It's this. There's only one word that gives us that whole phrase. And it's the word is curion, curion, and it literally means of the Lord. And scholars way smarter than I am have looked at this word carefully from about every angle. And they have concluded that what Paul was saying here when he said to what? 
to train them and instruct them. It's of the, that comes from the Lord or of the Lord, what they're, really, what they're really saying. You're gonna have to stick with me here. He's not saying train them in the things of the Lord or discipline them in the stuff of God or something like that. What he's really saying is train them in the way that Jesus trained. It's the training of the Lord. Train them in the way, in the teachings. No, not in the teachings. In the way that Jesus taught them. See the difference? Train them in the way that Jesus taught them. And I agree with the scholars about the Greek here. I believe now that what Paul was going for here was to tell fathers specifically, but parents of all sorts generally, that their task is to be Jesus to their children no matter what their children's age. So here's the Tim Ayers translation of the verse. Okay, you ready for this? It goes like this. Fathers and mothers, do not do anything to provoke your children to anger, no matter what the age of your children, but nurture your cherished ones by training them and instructing them in the same way that Jesus trained his cherished ones. And so the question immediately becomes, how did Jesus teach and nurture his cherished ones? And I'm just going to get right to it. These, these are the words that were used to describe Jesus in his relationship with his disciples. They are, he was tender-hearted, he was merciful, he was kind, he was humble, he was gentle, and he was patient. And can I just tell you, that changes everything for me about this parenting business. Everything. I have been thinking about this sermon for a good while. Thinking about what I've learned from experience. And now I've been thinking about how I should use Jesus as a template for my relationships with my adult children. And it has changed me. It's changed me. And so I'm going to risk something. At the risk of looking like I'm a know-it-all, I'm going to give you a list of few things that I feel are important to remember as we parent adult children as we think about the meaning of that verse. Oh, and I'm going to have some advice for adult children of adult parents. And then I'm going to have some advice for all of us. So here we go. First thing is this, that I have realized that it's not hard for me to think of my children like this. Like that. That's what I think of. When they're really this. And this, and this, it's easy to forget that time continually moves on. Things change. The ways of the world change. And it's so easy to get locked into thinking that my way of seeing the world is how everybody should see the world. And here is my advice. Do everything you can to stay current with who your children are right now. When my children were younger, I realized I was always about two years behind. Seriously, my fifth, uh, they're seventh graders and I'm thinking they still like fifth grade things. They don't. My children are adults in a very different world than I was th when I was their age. So my advice, again, is to stay as current as you can and be certain you really know what they're dealing with at this moment. Here's something. I, I brought t some pictures of what my children are dealing with at this moment. Um, oh, I'll show those later. Hang on. Hang on. I'll show those later. Also, another bit of advice that I have is... Um, is to realize that it's uh, easy to forget to compliment your children. That's one I really have realized uh, when I, even though I may not always agree with their decisions, if they have found a solution that works for their family, I should let them know that I am proud of them. 
because me just worrying about breaking their spirit isn't enough. I also need to be all about building up their spirits as well. Complimenting them goes a long way. It really does. And I don't want to sound too spiritual here, but pray for your adult children. Pray for them. I know that praying for them seems self-evident, but I've started praying for them like Jesus prayed for us, for all of us in his last prayer before he went to the cross. And this is what he prayed. He prayed that we, his cherished ones, would be filled with joy and that we would live holy lives and that we would find a deep sense of calling and that we, our lives would be something that gave glory to God. And I have to be honest, I never prayed for any of that for my kids when they were, when, before I started thinking about this. Praying those kinds of prayers for my children has changed my attitude a great deal. And then something else. In every conversation, work at guarding your children's hearts. And here's how you do that. You never say anything that leads to anger, jealousy, bitterness, or shame. Okay? That one's hard, but it helps. And always remember that we raised our children, we nurtured them for life as adults. Let them go. Let them be adults. And don't let your words become an added source of unnecessary, unnecessary stress for them. I know that in my own life, most of the stress that I had from my, mostly my mother, was always from things she said that shamed me. Just being honest. Okay, now I'm going to just give you the really fast, the 12 Tim Ayers practical axioms, okay, the wisdom act axioms. So let's, if you want to write these down or something, it's going to go really fast. If you're the parent of an adult child, don't give unsolicited advice. Just don't. Okay, if they don't ask for it, don't give it. Number two, whatever you do, don't criticize your children's parenting. Don't do it. Number three, work at being the best model of good parenting in your adult children's lives. Make sure that they're looking up to you rather than somebody else, like the neighbor or somebody else at church. You don't want that. You want them to look to you. And again, here's where it was. Remember their, their age and think carefully about what it's like to be them as they're dealing with things in this world here. This is what my one son is dealing with right now. Oh no, this is my daughter. She just had that baby last month. And then another of my children just had that one th Thursday. And then my son is dealing with this, a little boy who's so wild that he fell off his, I think he fell off a big rock and blackened both of his eyes. I haven't thought about those things for a long time, but you know what? That little boy right there, he's dealing with that right now, with how much he's upset about having that he can't ride his bike for a while because he hurt himself, those things. Just remember that stuff. Fifth thing is listen more than you talk. Ask questions that show you understand or that you want to understand. That's really important. If you just ask the right questions, you're, you'll hear the good things. Then never, never lecture. Okay. Here's a big one. Text or call before you come over. Dropping in is not cool. Okay. Observe respectful boundaries. Remember what it was when you had your young family and you, you didn't really want somebody just coming in and telling you what to do, that kind of thing, or your mother or that kind of thing, just re be respectful. And then don't quickly rescue. This is a hard one. When there's a sudden problem that they need to deal with, but part of being an adult is figuring how to take care of these things on your own. I know it feels good to be able to pay for stuff and to take care of them, but you don't do them any favors when you become an easy source of rescue. 
And here's another practical one. When you go out to dinner or you do things together, let them pay. Let them pay. No, make them pay sometimes. Okay? I could talk a lot about that one. Um, Take my word for it. This helps in the long run. And when you do get asked for advice, be extremely cautious that you don't start making judgments. Judgments. And even when you are making judgments, keep them to yourself. Okay? Don't express them. And while I'm at it, I got three more. Can I do three more? Okay, I'm gonna, I don't care. I'm going to give you three more. Um, accept their significant others. Receive them with open arms. Now, believe it or not, you being magnanimous, when they bring that one home and you open your arms to this new special person, you welcoming them into the home helps you a great deal because what it does, you have to realize that your adult child is actually still trying to figure out if that's the right one. And if you go negative right off, they'll get defensive and stay with them as long as they have to just to prove you wrong. So even if you are shocked, (laughs) open your arms, okay? Second, make being together fun. But here's the the part about it that's important. Don't try to reenact the past. Just because you put all your kids in matching pajamas when they were little, don't buy everybody in the whole family matching pajamas. That's not cool, okay? Build new things into the family, new memories. And finally, this is like huge. Don't ever say, why don't you answer my texts? And never say, why don't you visit more often? Keep it to yourself, okay? You're not helping when you ask that question. I could go on and on like this. I I could take my word for it. But I do have some things to say for adult children to think about as they relate to their older parents. First is don't pick arguments. Don't come with the gun loaded, in other words, if you know what I'm saying. Ready to fight. And secondly, you don't have to state your opinion on everything. Okay? You just don't. And third, don't make your parents feel defensive right off. And please don't see disagreement as criticism of you personally, necessarily. And certainly don't make vast assumptions about generational differences, like everybody in your parents' generation is unaware or incapable of change. In other words, please don't treat your parents like children, please. And here's a big one, take responsibility for your own actions and your own attitudes. That works. And be quick to offer and ask for forgiveness. And if you do ask your parents for advice, listen carefully and do your best to include something that they told you in the way that you work out the problem. And here's a big one. Spend time with your parents outside of the perfunctory moments like birthdays and holidays. In other words, try to be available just for some regular old life from time to time. And this one I had to learn. Show your parents that you love them in a way that is expressed that you know they will appreciate. I finally figured out that what my dad likes the most is going to the Indians games with me and to the hockey, to the fuel. That's what he wants from me. So every birthday, every holiday, he gets the same thing. He gets a ticket to to go do that with me. And you know what it says to him? I know him well enough to show him love in a way that he wants it expressed. Then I've got one more thing to say to to younger adults. And I know you don't want to hear this, but try to keep in mind how fast time passes. If you have young children now, or someday have young children, 
you will wake up some morning and find out that you are suddenly the parent of an adult. How that happened, you, do not, you will not know. But it happens. So give your parents some room to figure things out because they weren't expecting this to happen so suddenly. I'm just being honest. And finally, please don't become helicopter parents to your parents. In other words, here's what I mean. Don't hover looking for something that says mom and dad are losing it. Your parents will want to stay as independent as possible for as long as they can, and they know that you are looking for a sign that they are losing their vibrance and they need to downsize. I'm just saying, you'll know when that time actually comes. Okay, and I have some advice for all of us, and this is important for everybody to remember, Don't freak out and turn everything into a catastrophe. Drama never helps, okay? It just doesn't. And have ground rules for disagreements and talk about these ground rules when there isn't a disagreement. You never make ground rules for these kinds of discussions in the middle of a difficult time. Just don't. It doesn't work. And then here's a big one. Allow one another to make mistakes without criticism. Mistakes are a normal part of life. And finally, apologize and forgive. Be the first one to do that. Believe me, it helps. Now, I know that this has been a lot of stuff. But I've really only scratched the surface. And I know that everybody has a unique and different circumstance and it can be difficult and wonderful at the same time but parents if we take Paul's command seriously and we do everything we can to not do anything to provoke our children to anger no matter what their age is but we nurture them as our cherished ones by instructing them in the same ways that Jesus nurtured his cherished ones it will go a long way towards making this new stage of life, all that God wants it to be for all of us, I'm just saying. And I'm going to end by reading a passage of Scripture that sums up what all of this Jesus nurturing looks like. Just listen to this and think about how these words from Paul might help you navigate this transition of your life no matter where you find yourself right now. It says this, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and make allowances for each other others' faults and forgive anyone who offends you and remember the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts for we are all called to live in peace and finally, always, always be thankful. That is the way that we are to parent our adult children. That's the way, okay? Let me pray for us. Father, I am thankful that your word speaks to these things. I am thankful that um, we have a model in your son. I'm thankful that we have your Holy Spirit to empower us to live this way. My prayer is that we will live in such a way that we bring Um, the presence of Jesus into all of our relationships and that it spills out into the world in ways that changes this dark and desperate world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. You'll also find service times and locations for all three of our Grace Church campuses. We would love for you to join us. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.